Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Prosperous Nonprofit. I am really excited to be here today with Alyssa Novoselic. Alyssa, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So like we do with all of our guests, I would love to start with just hearing a little bit about your journey. I was just telling you before we got started, I was reading your bio and I'm like, wow, I did not know that you did all these things. I did not know you were a teacher. Um, so tell us a little bit about the journey and the different stops along the way that led you to what you're doing now. Absolutely. Um, well, again, thank you so much for having me. I'm a huge fan of 100 Degrees and all the work that you are doing out in the world. Uh, and my journey is, I think, very similar in many ways to yours and a lot of the people that you have employed um, at 100 Degrees, uh, really looking for uh, a chance to have impact in the work that we're doing is the the big uh, overarching theme of, of my career. So for the last 20 years, uh, I started out as a teacher, an educator, um, was uh, trained here in Michigan at the University of Michigan, and then left to teach um, uh, in Arizona. I taught in a rural school setting called Camp Verde, um, where we were adjacent to the Yavapai Apache Reservation um, out there and learned just wonderful lessons of, of uh, different um, uh, different ways of being uh, than the Midwest. So I was very lucky to teach young people out there. I was curious after that um, experience, uh, the differences that existed between what I saw in schools in the Metro Detroit area um, and Arizona. So as I was looking at how school buildings were funded, what educational um, opportunities there were for young people, I was noticing different decisions by uh, decision makers around um, how they were allocating money. And my formal training hadn't included any of that thus far. So my wonderful principal um, there encouraged me to further my education in the financial space. I ended up going to get an MBA uh, in New Hampshire, and I focused my study and my points of inquiry on nonprofit, public school, government finance, because I saw a lot of equity issues in how money was allocated um, for better or for worse there. So through my MBA, I was able to see how different schools, organizations, um, government entities were structured um, and how financial you know, systems really had a, a direct correlation to um, how folks were able to access resources and, and, um, you know, gain further education in, in their, their lives. Um, I wound up my first, I guess you'd say real job was in West Virginia. Uh, I worked for a small nonprofit, um, kind of doing a, uh, a lot of different things. So uh, jumped into the accounting, jumped into the grant writing. So many people, you know, starting in a really small nonprofit um, have to be a master of, of all things. And I was really lucky to be able to see the development side, the programmatic side, and the finance side all at once. I then moved into a director of development role in arts and culture in West Virginia. Uh, so I got to really uh, hone my skill on the fundraising side and then became an executive director of the Statewide Arts Foundation there. Um, that was a great leadership path for me um, and then uh, ended up uh, being an executive director again, coming back home in 2016 to lead an arts and culture organization on the southwest side of Detroit. Um, during the pandemic, lots of things shifted and I was really called upon by many community business leaders, notably women um, in the city of Detroit to help them think through their financial processes, procedures, uh, and, and things of that sort. So my consulting practice came out of um, just an organic need from a lot of my friends who own restaurants, were artists, um, ran organizations that said, we really need some help. This is a really trying time for us. Can you can you assist? So I spun off my consulting practice um, to do that uh, full time. And where I am now at the Empowerment Plan, we're, we're one of my clients. So they, I got to see firsthand 
um, the wonderful impact that this organization has on the city of Detroit, particularly the east side of the city. Um, obviously, Veronica as CEO um, has created over the last 10 years a, a wonderful culture in the organization. And I fell in love with the work as a consultant. Um, and I was invited to join the staff about two and a half years ago as the VP of Finance and Operations. Amazing. I I don't know if I knew that you were in fundraising and the executive director of a couple different organizations, because I think that brings kind of an interesting perspective to your work now really focusing on finance. And so you're right. Um, our journeys are definitely very similar, like wearing all the hats in a couple of roles, but I've never, I've never been a fundraiser. Um, I just see the numbers on the other side when they come in or, or when they don't come right. in. So how has like, how has being a fundraiser and really like living in those shoes as well as being an executive director, how has that shaped the way that you approach the finance side of things? Yeah, so I think it, it has created a finance department that is very participatory um, and very much about bringing the full team along. So we, for example, our budgeting process is a three month uh, long budgeting process. It involves the full team. Um, everyone has a role in it and we really come together um, to have really meaningful discussions. So. It's not just me in my office, you know, creating a budget and saying, do I have your approval? So I think that is something that I probably would have done if I was a newer um, finance professional, uh, not wanting to bother the team, not, you know, wanting wanting them to let, let them do their other things. But what I've found is just there's so much value in the co-creation of financial um, documents, instruments, things of that sort that really provide for um you know, to create a financially savvy culture, but also to move forward some bigger strategic initiatives. Um, and so I think I bring that lens of, uh, you know, development of, of my team, um, getting their input on on the financial side of things and, and really being a transparent leader about uh, where some of our roadblocks could be, you know, as we move into to new fiscal years. Another example of that is I meet um, monthly with each director level position. We have a phenomenal chief development officer here, Erica George, who has been with the organization almost the entire duration. And she and I are in constant communication about, you know, the st status of the organization and, and, and opportunities. Um, so I think those are two just things that um, uh, really I think about, but also from a fundraising side, what I'd like to lead with our full team, which is a team of about 60 people, um, is that, you know, we are all stewards of this mission and this organization, no matter where we sit in, in uh, you know, in the org chart. And um, I really take that to heart in, in the conversations I'm, I'm having with you right now and um, out in, in the broader Detroit community. Oh, I love that so much. Um, not only the sort of the co-creation and collaboration piece, but also that transparency um, and really, you know, um, I always talk about transparency, really leading to greater engagement. And I think that's just what you said. You know, you are, you're transparent about the numbers and then the whole team, we are all stewards of these resources together. So everybody is more engaged um, when they know what's going on um, versus, you know, being sort of hidden behind some, you know, some, some wall or some barrier. So yeah, I, I love that. So I want to take like a little bit of a diversion because you mentioned something about the culture at empowerment plan and um that being something that really drew you in and i think that there's you know there's lots of talk about culture for sure. Um, sure but in the nonprofit sector i'm just seeing so many organizations and so many leaders just like working so hard towards the mission that we're forgetting this piece of building a really strong internal culture. So I would love to hear a little bit more about what the culture is like in Empowerment Plan. What was it that, um, that drew you in and how are you as leaders of the organization um, building, you know, really intentionally building a culture of an organization that people want to be at? 
Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I do think uh, it is a differentiator here. Um, it is what keeps me here. It would, it's what keeps me motivated. And I think that I have learned so much uh, from Veronica, notably the CEO. Uh, Koi Mosley is our HR, HR director who leads a lot of this work, but also from our broader team. So um, one of the things that I think well, first, first and foremost, the thing that I think is is most important is the CEO certainly sets the tone for culture. So, uh, the way in which Veronica encourages us to have, you know, I think self care is the buzz the buzzword, but really focus on the personal as much as the professional um, is is felt. I feel like in 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 this entire building. So that comes from the people who are walking in the door the first week of employment here at Empowerment Plan, oftentimes coming from, you know, a shelter and, and facing a really large transition. So we really focus on our, our colleagues that are coming in that perspective and thinking about what they need in order to be successful. So when we focus on that, it, it, it bleeds into the rest of the org chart in, in how we function with each other because we know if we're not okay as individuals there's no way we're going to do our our job well so that really is the through line um you know we lead uh from some of our values of uh having fun but working really hard um taking care of one another and uh, you know, we really hold each other accountable to that. So some of like the, the tactical things that have come through that is this past year, we've, uh, Koi has, our HR director has led a 360 review process, much more focused on our values than our um, uh, work outputs. Uh, we take time to celebrate our wins. We have monthly team meetings where we come together and share a meal and we um, we do what's called spin the wheel, where we celebrate people's accomplishments and they get a variety of, of things, gift cards and swag and whatnot. Um, and we cheer people on in, in their successes. We take time to think strategically and not just um, tactically. So um, many of us get lost in the minutia the, as a small to mid-sized you know, organization, but making sure that we have time to process things um, is very important. So I think it is, you know, the, Veronica's setting a tone of a culture of inclusion uh, with, the, with a team that holds each other accountable to these values and um, making sure that we are carving out the necessary moments to do so. Uh, from a financial side of things, it's incredibly important to focus on culture. And I think that has been something that I have learned the last, you know, the 15 to 20 years that I've, you know, been growing as a professional, but really uh, the last five to 10 years, uh, just seeing organizations as I've been able to consult with them, lead them, <laughs> be part of them, uh, the ones that really keep good people motivated and going and have greater impact are the ones that do focus on that culture and not just, you know, the bottom line. Yeah, that's such a good point too, because as we all know, it is so expensive to have to replace someone. And so um, if you've got constant turnover in your organization, you are going to see that that is going to impact your bottom line. And so if you can have this intentionality around building culture, um, you're going to save money. <laughs> like, honestly, mm -hmm. you're going to save money. Um, and one thing that, um, you know, that I want to think about a lot of organizations right now. Um, we're recording this in September. I think this is going to go live in October, but many organizations are building their budgets for next year um, right now. And so really thinking about how your budget reflects your values is a conversation that I have a lot. It's like, okay, we value culture, but if we 
have no money to spend on something like, you know, gift cards for our staff or team lunches or anything like that. If we're not willing to spend that money, it doesn't have to be a lot. Um, then our budget is really not reflecting our values and we're not really as committed to culture as we say we are. So I would just encourage anyone listening to really think about that. If you are building your budget for next year, thinking about, okay, what do, what is the impact that we want to have not only in our programs, but with our staff and what resources do we need to make that happen? And, um, you know, sort of thinking about the other side of things, if we're not investing in our team and investing in our culture, we're going to lose people. And that is way more expensive than, you know, having some really um, meaningful team lunches and, you know, celebrating our wins and things like that. So, yeah, yeah definitely. I, and oftentimes I say, I think I'm a very non-traditional um, uh, VP of finance because, I say, can we afford not to do this, right? And I think that that is the lens that I have kind of grown into in, in you know, this this role because in many ways, like what you're talking about, you cannot, you can't afford not to do the things that really keep and motivate people. And that that isn't to say that all of this needs to be expensive. Um, we have a morale committee. Um, that's another thing that I, could mention that's made up of um you know eight to ten folks across the organization that meets and talks about how are we keeping up morale and sometimes it's just we have you know one-on-one -on -one coffee dates we talk about it you know things outside of work it, it doesn't have to be this really expensive bonus structure and, and all of the other things that do that that are important to think about um but culture is created through relationships and if if you are a leader of an organization uh, in any capacity, uh, you have the power to to influence your team in that way and and uh, be having those conversations. Oops, my internet just is like gone completely. Oh no. Oh, sorry. Okay. I think it's working now. Um, the last thing I heard you say was we have a morale committee. So maybe just start. We have a morale committee and keep going. <laughs> if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Where was I know what we were talking about before that. Um, well, you were saying can we afford not to do this was what you were right, talking okay. about. I wrote that down. <laughs> yeah. So one of, one of the other important things that uh, empowerment plan um, has at our organization is a morale committee made up of eight to 10 folks across the organization that think about morale um, here in the building. Uh, and so this doesn't necessarily have to be an expensive thing. So they're thinking about ways in which we can gather, which w ways in which we can, you know, facilitate this specific discussions about different areas of the organization, different topics. Um, so as you're building a budget, there are a lot of other like intangible things that you can also think about to build culture in the organization. Um, and some of the bigger things, like I said, when you're asking yourself, can we afford not to do this thing for our people, um, having a longer uh, lens on how this is going to have impact internally in your own organization is something that's very important. I mean, Stephanie, I see you do this, you know, even from afar, I don't know your internal operations, but the way that you're focused on having conversations and building a team that's reflective of your values um, taking retreats, uh, doing all of that. These are really important things to do to 
keep people engaged in the work and and remind them um, that that we are humans. All of us are humans here, uh, with mm-hmm. a lot of things, uh, nuances to to our lives, and and putting that first is is very important. Hmm. I love that. Um. I totally agree. And you know, our team retreats. They're not like inexpensive. They are, they are, right. they're not, you know, we're not, it's not like the lap of luxury, but it's like, I do want to treat our employees to a nice time and four days together. And that experience for 10 or 15 people is not, it's not cheap. It's a major budget line item, but it is so sure. important to us that, um, yeah, that, that we do it every single year. And so really thinking about, yeah, aligning, thinking about the values of your organization and aligning that as your, as you're preparing your budget, um, I think is huge. So thank you so much for sharing all that about culture. That was definitely a deviation from, um, a, a little bit from the finance piece, but I think so, so important, um, to really be intentional about that. Um, so I'm going to shift us back to, um, talking a little bit about this sort of like CFO type role. I know you're the the VP of finance, which is basically the same thing, right? I mean, you're the senior finance person at the organization. Um, and tell me about the sort of CEO CFO relationship. Um, because I know that, you know, oftentimes you, you know, one might think of the CEO as like the visionary and then the CFO is here to come in and like sprinkle a dose of reality on the vision. And we are often think thought of as like, oh, the CFO, that's the naysayer. That's the one to shoot down all the big ideas because we don't have enough money or whatever. Um, but I have seen many, many examples of how that's not the case and how the CFO, you know, really supports the the CEO's vision in different ways. So tell me about the CEO CFO relationship that either you've been a part of or you've seen in different organizations and maybe, you know, what works really well? How do you complement one another? And maybe, you know, in what sort of instances do you butt heads and kind of how you move past that and, and move together to, um, you know, move, make progress in the organization? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and um, uh, as you probably have can tell from what I've said before, I have a really wonderful relationship with Veronica Scott, who's the CEO of Empowerment Plan. She founded this organization. Um, it was a spinoff of her co- college project when she was an undergrad, and so she's really grown from a young, you know, adolescent really to fantastic leader being nationally, you know, globally recognized. So um, first of all, I just have the utmost respect for her journey and the way in which I see her continually be reflective of how she takes up space as a leader, uh, who she who she is, uh, you know, growing into and, and all of the leadership traits that that she naturally has. So one of the things that's very important to me with her, with uh, other clients that I have. So uh, I in addition to empowerment plan, my side hustle is a, a greater impact, which I mentioned earlier. I work with about uh, 10 organizations and businesses um, mostly in the city of Detroit. Uh, and so I work with the, the leaders there. So I see a lot of different CEOs um, on a daily basis. Uh, with Veronica in particular, we are very collaborative. Um, Veronica is definitely a creative visionary um, and she started Empowerment Plan in art school. So I think my background in uh, working in, in arts and education in particular has led me to uh, be a really strong CFO for creative CEOs. So coming in to and understanding how artists, um, creatives brains work and putting the um, uh, you know, the spreadsheets and the, the minutia and the strategy together behind that is, is a very natural uh, place for me to be a good partner to to that type of, of CEO. Um, Veronica loves to have working sessions. So we do that a lot. We meet often at her house, um, at, you know, coffee shops outside of the office to uh, work together collaboratively. I've noticed that's very important to her. So that's one of the, the things that we that we do. Um, and she also leans on me for a, a lot of strategy work, right? I think that's also something that um, like you said, the picture of a CFO in people's mind is the naysayer, it's the no person. And I mean, that really 
can't be further than the truth. Certainly half of, you know, a lot of my job is about maintaining controls in the organization and providing the highest level and rigorous level of ethical financial stewardship and standards 100%. But it is definitely, I'm definitely not the no person on the team. Um, and where I think Veronica and I shine is when we're able to, um, yeah, co-create something together. So whether that's the, the organizational budget, whether that's thinking through how we're bringing in uh, a consultant to lead us through whatever we're, you know, point of inquiry, we're, we're talking about uh, lobbying uh, for state dollars um, at the state capitol. Uh, all of those things, we're really, really true, true partners there. I love that you've got those sort of complementary skills. So, you know, she's got this big creative vision and you can help put some strategy and some numbers behind it. And I think, you know, one thing that really sort of stood out to me that you said was how you really understand how her brain works. And I think there's, you know, an understanding that it's possibly different than the way your brain works and being able to really understand her um, and work in a way that works for both of you, I think is huge. Um, have you, have y'all either, either with Veronica or with um, other CEOs, or if you've seen any other sort of CEO, CFO partnerships, are there any like tools that you've used or assessments that you've taken to really help understand each other um, on a deeper level or, or no? I mean, I think that as a leader, I, I dive into those sort of discussions um, naturally. So it's not mm -hmm. just about the, <laughs> the numbers at hand, right? It is very much about th what they're, what they're thinking about, what is challenging for them, how they're processing this. So kind of like what we were talking about with culture, like where is your head at about this information is very important before getting into the minutia. So I think just as a, mm -hmm. as a leader, as, a, as an executive, as a, you know, the owner of my own company, like that, that is just important in the work that we do as consultants um, uh, and, you know, C CFO type folks to really distill what the issue is. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, uh, you, certainly we've, uh, you know, done all, all of the things before, you know, like strength-based assessments, um, mm -hmm. Enneagrams, <laughs> the DISC, yeah. um, all yeah. of those things have been very important to my learning uh, as a leader and how I relate to people. Recently, mm -hmm. uh, two weeks ago, I think, uh, we just went through a DISC assessment as a, a full empowerment plan team. Let me pause mm. real quick. Can you hear the horn? Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Let's wait for that to... Okay, let's see. Okay, I'll start again. About two weeks ago, as a team, we went through a DISC assessment with a you know outside facilitator, and were able to see how we plot as a, a leadership mm. team out with one another, and it was very. Um, uh, you know, eye opening and and made me understand my team even more. Nothing was surprising with what anyone was, you know, coming out and saying. Um, particularly, you know, Veronica, I, I can't even remember which quadrant she was in, but we had complementary quadrants, which which also made sense to me. So I think all of those sorts of things. I'm a, a big believer in in uh, doing those things. Obviously, not taking them to, like to the bank of this is who I am because we're all complex mm -hmm. individuals, but they're very good points of um, discussion about about how you work and, and what you do. I think as it relates to what we do here and one of the other pieces of culture that really shines through of empowerment plan is we really believe in strength based um, uh, working like I really respect my colleagues and the fact that their skill set is moving forward a piece of the organization in a way that mine might not be able to do so and I feel that from them they really rely on me to make sure that our you know we do have proper financial controls that we're projecting out to the, f the future um, and I feel very supported in my role of that I think that's also a, a, a myth that of, of the CE, the traditional CEO that you're talking about before, mm -hmm. um, being the bad guy, I actually feel totally the opposite. I am very much relied upon for 
um, my perspective um, and expertise uh, in, in the furtherance of whatever project that, that folks are talking about. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's so good. Oh, I love everything you said. Um, I think that, you know, when you were talking before, I think the fact that you're kind of willing to have these conversations and just be like, really make the effort to understand how other people work. And like you were saying, respect people for what they are bringing to the table, I think is is so huge because, um, you know, it's, it's real easy to just make assumptions, but if you're willing to come to the table and have conversations, I think that's going to further, um, your work so much more. And, um, what else was I going to say? Oh, about the, like the disc and the Enneagram and mm -hmm. all the things. I totally agree. I love those so much because I think they just give us, well, you know, they, if you take every piece of that to heart, like, yes, you will be painted into a box. And so we don't need to take it like to the absolute letter of what these things say that like we are, but I do think it gives us common language to understand like, oh, the reason that you react this way when I asked you to do that is because this is kind of generally how you see the world. Okay. That makes so much more sense now. Um, so I agree. We've been, um, we've done strengths finders with, oh, yeah. um, with our team that I really liked. And as you were talking, I'm like, oh, we got to do this with our new people and like map it out. Like you were talking about with disc. Um, so yeah, I love that one. Um, that's fantastic. I, I really like that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the role of the modern CFO mm -hmm. and what are you seeing? Like, what are some trends that you're seeing in the sector that, you know, a CFO needs to deal with? Um, what are you seeing some challenges that a CFO, um, needs to overcome at this point? Kind of what are you seeing broadly in the sector as a nonprofit CFO? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that obviously I really love being a modern CFO, I think that there is such a great place for people who are maybe coming out of business school and accounting um, as younger professionals, there is definitely a place for you in, in the nonprofit scene. And that is something that I am, have been saying through and through. Um, it, for whatever reason, uh, the social impact space has not, um, in my opinion, really caught up to that sort of training in formal business schools and whatnot. When you're talking about social impact in business schools, I'll just use that as an example, um, you're usually talking about product development um, or some, you know, some sort of other spinoff of like if investing or, or whatnot from, from, from the social space. But from a just a pure CFO standpoint, this is not a career path that was ever presented as something that I could do, um, even with my my formal education. So that's number one. There's space for you if this is your career path. There's there's plenty of opportunity. Um, I think on the flip of that, it's a very misunderstood segment of American finance in general. Uh, you know, there's certainly from an audit level, lots of firms that specialize in nonprofit compliance um, from an accounting standpoint. But when you really get down to the brass tacks, and I'm talking about that first organization I worked with, the budget was probably 400,000, um, maybe even less. The things that we had to figure out how to do on our own, you know, how to be in compliance with grants, how to use QuickBooks. All you know, I learned that I was a self-taught QuickBooks person. There's a huge gap there between you know the the high level accounting firms and what this practice looks like on the ground. And so it is my hope, and obviously why I'm a huge 100 degrees fan, is that we can continue to educate and um, bring along, you know, these very capable professionals to get into these roles, because um, there just isn't a ton of, uh, there isn't a ton of, re of resources out there for nonprofit CFOs. Um, my peers, uh, are few and far between in the city of Detroit. I can tell you when I was an executive director, I had, it, there certainly are not even enough 
networks for executive directors, but I had a much bigger network, much bigger opportunity to um, co-convene with, with executive directors across the city. I don't have that as a CFO um, of nonprofit. Um, there's been a couple groups that I've been a part of. One I'm really excited to um, join that just started um, through Red F, which is a workforce development organization that's focusing on this sort of thing. Um, but that's also something I would like to see is more connectedness between those of us doing this work. And uh, I think, you know, one of the things that I really appreciated about meeting you, and I gosh, that was probably three, three or so years ago, was like, yeah, I started Greater Impact. And I thought there was no, no, no one else in the space doing this work and just the enormous need for it. And so I'm just mm -hmm. so I was so excited to meet you and see that you're building a team and you're, you know, from, from everything I can see doing it really responsibly to meet the needs of these small to mid-sized nonprofits um, right where they are. Right. Uh, I, I don't know if you've experienced this, but many times as a, as a CFO, you telling people that this is normal, <laughs> you know, we will work through this you are definitely not alone with this issue um, is probably the thing that clients and, you know, my colleagues have come back and said, that was the most meaningful thing that you did for me was to lead me, th you know, through this. So yeah, we're in spreadsheets and we're numbers people, but it is so important to think about as this whole theme of this conversation, where that person is on the other side of it and how to get them through. Because, you know, those of us in the impact space, we really, we just want to, we want to see that we want, we want to see a, a better world for whatever, you know, industry that, that we're working in. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I have so many ideas that like tackle everything that you talked about. And sometimes my ideas are so big that they feel very scary. And, um, I'm like, how am I even going to like accomplish any of this? And so, a couple things that you mentioned. So the career path thing and not knowing this was a career path. I didn't either. And I have my master's in public administration with folk, like a focus on nonprofit management. And I was at NYU and did my degree there. And I look back to that now at this point, it was, um, Oh my gosh, 15 years ago, I started that degree. Um, whew, that was a long time ago. I did not realize that number got so big. Um, but the the sort of the goal was like to get into a big nonprofit organization and that yeah. almost has like a corporate structure to it. And I think about what I learned in my master's program and I'm like, I use basically nothing that I learned there because when you're working in an organization whose budget is a million dollars or even less than a million dollars or even up to like $10 million. You are wearing all the hats. You are doing all the things. And my master's degree virtually did no preparation whatsoever for that type of work mm -hmm. and definitely didn't talk about, okay, um, what is it like to be the CFO of a $5 million organization? Like we were not having those conversations and talking about the things that now I've learned after working with, at this point, probably hundreds of organizations that it's just like there, there is no clear career path. So I think that's a huge um, observation that you had. And the other day I was, um, I was actually at a retreat with other business owners and we were kind of dreaming up, like, what are like the biggest ideas that you can think of in, in your business? And I was like, I want to build a master's degree level curriculum for like, for nonprofit leaders what it's actually like to work in a nonprofit, like the, the master's program I had just like did not hit that mark at all. And I'm like, oh, that's a big project. I don't know if I'm ready to quite take that on, but I think that's huge. And I think it, you know, it just goes along with what you were saying as well. Like your MBA just didn't prepare you for working in the sector in the way that you are. So I think that's huge. Yeah. And the connect here, go ahead. No, I'm just saying, well, sign me up, sign me up to be part of that. Um, I, on the side, also teach at Wayne State University here in Detroit, uh, a class to their arts administrators on financial accounting. And so um, mm. I'm very excited when Wayne State decided to do that, because it's like a lot of these arts administrators are going on into, you know, really important institutions from a cultural standpoint in the city of Detroit, and didn't know how to read a profit and loss statement, didn't know what a balance sheet was. And so I 
took it as a great opportunity to to teach just what I do every day to these people who were like I didn't think this was for me at all and now I feel really empowered to like go and ask these questions when I'm on interviews and and all these things and so that was really that has been a spark for me to see just what we um what I would love to see that that whole curriculum path and development um I'm I'm all on board to be your partner in that (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. We're going to stop the record button in a couple of minutes. And I'm like, we need to keep talking about this. <laughs> um, good. And the other, the other piece about there not really being a space for nonprofit finance leaders. I haven't found anything either. I feel like um, I built my team. So now I kind of have one, but I had to make it myself. And, um, you know, at the beginning of my business, I sort of had the choice of like, okay, Am I going to turn away clients and just handle the the work that I can do myself? Or am I going to find other people that can do this with me? And I chose the latter because I don't know, because I wanted to, and I wanted to be able to help more organizations. So I've kind of created this little, like this little network of the 15 of us um, together, but that, you know, there is a much larger need. Um, you're right for nonprofit finance professionals to get together. So maybe we can talk about, um, we could talk offline about what, we, what we can create for those people as well. <laughs> so many ideas. Um, Okay. The last thing that I want to talk about, um, before we, before we hop off, I know we just have a few more minutes left. So, um, what does, what is the role of technology and data look like in, in your work as a nonprofit CFO? Like how are you jumping on new technology or maybe not, um, and, (laughs) and using data to really drive your work? That's that's a great question. I think this is such a hard thing for small to mid-sized nonprofits to tackle because there's so much out there. Um, they're so expensive in many ways, uh, and you have to do you have to figure out how to um, intertwine them so that you are really uh, functioning well from a you know a monthly close process. So, if you're in finance, you know the monthly close process is. Uh, guides all of the work um, toward the end of getting the good data. So an empowerment plan, um, we have different data systems for each a part of our organization. And one of the things that makes us unique at empowerment plan is we produce a sleeping bag coat that gets distributed all across the globe um, to thousands upon thousands of individuals who are experiencing homelessness. So we really, we run a 22,000 square foot manufacturing facility um, on the east side of Detroit where our employees come and they learn the skills to make the coat and get wraparound services. Um, They're generally here for about two years. So uh, we have a lot of really interesting things from a financial standpoint that relate to our inventory, shipping, delivery that many nonprofits might not have. So we have a specific inventory software that we work with um, for the manufacturing side of our house. We have a development software where we manage our donors. We have a bill pay software. We use, you know, QuickBooks is the hub of everything that that I do. Um, certainly where a lot of things are still in spreadsheets that I would love to get get out of there. Um, and so there's just a many, many different things that we do to be able to get to that month end process. I am no, by no stretch of the imagination, uh, technologically savvy. Um, I like what it can do for me. Like I said, I learned QuickBooks on my own. I'm self-taught. Um, it, it, it comes to me naturally when I can, you know, watch videos about it or, or whatever. And I love that they have continued education around it, but I feel as though a big gap that I've seen with organizations I work with small to mid size are uh, the almost like the requirements of these huge, robust um, uh, information technology platforms without really anyone to run it. So a lot of the conversations that I've been in with other organizations relating to data is like, how do we manage this in a really smart way? Um, So one of the first things that I did when I got to empowerment plan, it's still on my whiteboard. I have a giant whiteboard in my office and I mapped out all of the systems and where they went just on my whiteboard said, all right, if we are talking about our in-kind process, when someone donates something to empowerment plan, 
how is that in-kind process moving through the system of data that we have? So my suggestion to anyone who's like, I, I don't even know what we have, how we use it. First stuff is just to map it out on your whiteboard. Um, and then what we did was we one by one uh, went through every single financial thing like in-kind, like inventory, like revenue recognition. And we wrote out all of our steps and what we did because you can't make change without understanding where you are, right? It's like benchmarking mm -hmm. 101. So mm -hmm. um, as it relates to technology, that's where we were able to see gaps, um, to see things that were being duplicated. Oh, Clatice, our, our administrative um, financial support uh, a colleague is keeping track of that in this spreadsheet, but you know the development team's also keeping track of that there. We don't need to duplicate that work. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, and I think it's taken us almost two years to get to a point where we're like, everything is running really well and, and our data is clean from a reconciliation process. So um, I, I guess my advice is start with the whiteboard and, and write everything down. Um, but there's definitely not one magic, you know, uh, IT fix for um, a complex organization. Yeah, that's such a good point. I feel like empowerment plan is potentially more complex than a lot of organizations. Um, but I love that idea of like mapping out your data. Like what is the journey that our data takes through this whole process? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that would really help find gaps in technology and, um, you know, and help you be able to identify that. So I think that's a great idea and something that I personally haven't done with data. I feel like half the data in our, like in our organization, we've gotten so much better, but like in our organization, it'd be like, okay, well it goes from here to a spreadsheet and then it stops. <laughs> like mm -hmm. we'll probably need to extend that a little bit, but, um, that's a, that's a fantastic idea. And one that I have not done before. Mm -hmm. Um, my last question for you is what does a prosperous nonprofit look like to you? Wow. Good question. Um, I think, you know, building on our conversation very much is focused on the people that are working in the organization and the people who, mm -hmm. uh, whom the organization serve. We're, we're here to, to help, uh, individuals and that must be the focus of everything that we do. So, um, whether, you know, whether that's building culture, um, having good recruitment, uh, making sure your donors are values aligned and understand what's happening. Um, that goes across the board, in my opinion, of bringing the right people to the table and doing it, you know, with, with those values at the center of what you do. From an operational side of things, um, it is uh, really paying attention uh, and getting out of messy mode, I would say, you know, making sure that you're, you are focused on how your processes are working. Um, the fact, uh, making sure that you have a feedback loop to get, get input on the processes that you have, um, writing it all down right now where we are, working on SOP standard operating procedures for the entire organization, which is very mm. important to me to see that it's, it's an extension of even my whiteboard start, right? Like how are, mm -hmm. how are we uh, acting and then how do we keep this going? So I think from a structural standpoint, marrying that sophistication with that culture is the key to, um, having a, a, a prosperous nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. So good. So good. I, I completely agree with you. And I just love, I say this on every episode, I think, but I just love that every single person that I've asked this question has a completely different answer. So, um, Alyssa, this has been such a pleasure. I'm so glad we got the chance to talk. Um, if our listeners are interested in learning more about, um, about your organization, both greater impact and empowerment plan, where can they find you? And of course we'll put the, we'll put the links in the show notes, but why don't you tell us where we can find you? 
Great. Well, Empowerment Plan is um, at www.empowermentplan.org and Greater Impact is at www.greaterimpactllc.com. Uh, please go follow Empowerment Plan socials. We have just such compelling content. Uh, the people I work with are amazing. They share their stories frequently. Um, and so uh, those are on uh, all, all the social channels, Facebook, um, Instagram, LinkedIn. And yeah, friend me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me there. Awesome. Alyssa, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. I appreciate you. Appreciate you.